quickly reintroduce myself again. Um, <clears throat> Uh, my uh, name is Morris Casey, and tonight's talk is on East, Eastern European migrants and the fight for Irish freedom. As I was saying um, on the other link before we ran into some tech hiccups, um, <clears throat> earlier today we had just over 650 euro in donations for the event, which really exceeded my expectations and which I'm really, really happy about. Um, so thank you so much to everyone who donated. Uh, and has joined us this evening. And also a note if you're watching a recording of this talk later to please um, do donate directly to a charity of your choice. So to begin, firstly, and I appreciate that this is perhaps unusual in an online lecture uh, where we are all in separate spaces, but I would like to ask you to observe a moment's silence for those who have lost their lives as a result of Russia's war on Ukraine. Thank you. So um, to introduce this talk a little bit more, this arises from research that I've been doing looking at um, what began really as research into Eastern European and Irish couples. So looking at um, Irish people who married Eastern European people in the early 20th century. And as I delved more into that research, I realized that a lot of these couples were involved in very kind of specific branches of, of political movements. And I thought that uh, this research would make a natural fit for this kind of fundraiser. So it's great to be able to share kind of some of my preliminary findings from that research. I did also try in the old tradition of genealogical researchers who delve into Irish president's histories to find some kind of Irish link to Volodymyr Zelensky. Um, unfortunately, the closest thing I could find was really that his uh, surname means green. So that's the closest Irish link he seems to have. To begin, I guess, with a kind of a personal story, um, these are two pictures. Uh, one on the left uh, I took in Odessa in 2017. Uh, when I visited the city, it had a red carpet laid out in front of the Odessa Opera House for the Odessa International Film Festival. And then on the right is present day Odessa with sandbags laid out in front of the same opera house anticipating an attack by Russian forces. In 2017 and then in 2018, I had visited a number of really amazing cities in two different countries, Kiev and Odessa in Ukraine, and then Moscow and St. Petersburg in Russia. I was there to learn a language and also to carry out research to learn more about the connection between these places and my own home, Ireland. But in truth, I've kind of known about these connections my entire life because I grew up in the town of Care in County Tipperary, which uh, some of you may know has one of the largest proportions of foreign born residents of any town in Ireland. In my first year of secondary school, for example, Ukraine, Poland, Romania and Lithuania were all represented amongst the nationalities of my classmates. And that was in a class of less than 30 people. And it was a great privilege really to grow up at that time uh, in my town's history and to be part of that generation who felt Irish identity growing wider as we ourselves grew up. And it's that experience that I think that has also influenced me in my own research interests. And watching what is unfolding now as part of the Russian military's invasion of Ukraine, in my mind, I think, have, I think a lot about the people in my town with personal connections to these countries, what they must be feeling. And I also think of the people I met in Kiev and Odessa. Um, and of course, I have so much admiration for the resistance of the Ukrainian people. And I also have a lot of admiration for the bravery of those who, who've risked their freedom to protest and report on the war within Russia. But the history that my town represents a longer history of inward migration to Ireland and how migrants have shaped Ireland. And it's that history that I've been thinking about a lot as well, 
since the beginning of the invasion in, uh, on February 24th. In the light of this um, horrific situation, I think we should really think about how our own national history propels us to welcome those fleeing violence from across the world. Because while our people so sanctuary abroad and those to whom we have provided sanctuary have also migrated here and have in turn shaped our nation. And anyone with even the most basic understanding of Irish revolutionary history has an inkling of this fact implicitly. Although I won't discuss this family in detail here because I have a preference of focusing on lesser known stories, one of the most famous names in the history of the Irish fight for freedom is a Polish name, Markovich. And while it's true that recent decades have, have seen a, a very important turning point in Irish migration history so that the shift from net outward migration to net inward migration, you can trace a sizable community um, uh, as, as early as the, the late 19th century and back beyond. The late David Fitzpatrick looked to the censuses of 1901 and 1911 to estimate the foreign-born population of Ireland. And he calculated that in those early 20th century censuses, there were 28,000 foreign-born residents in Ireland. And the second largest community was composed of those who were, um, and the second largest community was composed of those who were from the territories of the then uh, vast Russian empire. Some left fleeing persecution and violence, uh, many came simply seeking economic opportunities and a large proportion of that community were Jewish. 28,000 might seem like a small number, when I began writing this talk a few weeks ago, Ireland had already seen the arrival of around 8,000 Ukrainian refugees. I'm sure that number is much larger today. But as Fitzpatrick noted, the cultural impact of 28,000 cosmopolitans in a country of 4 million was potentially immense when we consider the intricate personal networks of neighborhood, workplace, and school fostered by Irish sociability. A word of caution, uh, just on definitions, we in Ireland can well appreciate the notion that national identity is a complex thing and that ethnicity and political loyalty are not synonymous. In the territories that composed the Russian Empire and much of which would eventually comprise the Soviet Union, national identity sometimes proved malleable in the furnace of revolutionary change. People might be born in the modern day territories of Lithuania or Ukraine, call themselves ethnically Russian. People born on the modern day territories of Russia might identify, for example, as Polish based on their parents' ethnicity. Judaism, which we might more readily classify as a religious identity today, could to a resident of the turn of the century, St. Petersburg, Odessa, or Bialystok, seem also as a national identity. And imperial border shifts complicated the picture further, with Prussian history giving rise to the Bolton Dutch ethnic Germans, who later became a significant portion of Russian imperial censuses. So we don't need to really unpack all that complexity in this talk, but I've tried to be attentive to the nuances of this, um, this, this complexity and to be guided by the people of the past themselves. But my advice for you is simply to embrace the fact that a person could identify one way on a census form, identify another in a newspaper article and be categorized as something else entirely differently in the eyes of a secret police um, surveillance report. And our modern world really is the product of these patchwork cosmopolitan identities. And we should just embrace really that multiplicity. So to begin our story um, and to begin looking at these individual migrants, I was going to, I'm going to begin a kind of natural starting point with Vladimir Pechorin or Pechorin in the Russian pronunciation. <clears throat> a very interesting figure, um, who was born in 18, uh, he um, <clears throat> was uh, first arrived in Ireland in 1851. He was a political exile born to a family of Polish origin in the town of Belica Dimirka in Ukraine, which is uh, not far from Kiev. It was, um, according to a news report I read, uh, occupied by Russian troops. Pecherin was part of the early 19th century world of Russian revolutionaries, inspired by the anti-Tsarist Decembrist revolt. Uh, in response to this, he moved westward, both physically and philosophically, eventually converting to Catholicism and training to be a redemptorist priest in Belgium. 
He spent time in London, and that's where he crossed paths with another more famous political exile, Alexander Gertsen, who was dubbed the father of Russian socialism, and whose correspondence with this man, Pacharin, was interrupted by Pacharin's move to Ireland in 1851. The major flashpoint of Pacharin's time in Ireland came in 1855, when he was leading a mission in Kingstown and what is now Don Leary. The final event of the mission featured Pacharin burning Amaro literature. And as Owen McWhite, an Irish scholar of Pacharin narrates, a local extremist Protestant clergyman decided to use this event to inflame sectarian bitterness by inciting a young boy to put a few Protestant testaments into one of the piles of books destined for the fire. Pacharin was duly charged with blasphemy and went on trial at the Green Street Courthouse. The prosecution's case was poor, and Pacharin emerged with his reputation fully intact. Uh, interestingly, Victor Frank, who was a Russian literature scholar, passed on to Owen McWhite lines from a Dublin street ballad sung at the time of Pacharin's trial for blasphemy, which Frank had in turn picked up in the 1940s from an 80-year-old Dubliner who remembered his mother singing him the song. And the lines went like this, the waving of hats and handkerchiefs, the like was never seen at Dublin and Kingstown for Father Green. And I love those kind of ways in which um, historical memory can, can pass down from person to person. Pacharin uh, later went on to become the first chaplain of the Matter Hospital in Dublin. And he also renewed his interest in revolutionary politics of the Russian Empire, from which he went into exile. McWise provides some interesting evidence that Pacharin may have clandestinely pro provided confession to members of the Fenian Brotherhood as well. Following his death in 1885, the Freeman's Journal described him as a familiar figure in Dublin and noted that he was a, quote, Russian by birth, but had lived so long in the country as to be looked upon as a citizen of Dublin. So let's turn then from Pacharin uh, to one of the um, great lesser known love stories of Irish political history. And this picture here is, is just an image of, a, of the, the Jewish assembly in Odessa as a kind of pointer to the, the context of the story. In 1864, Herman and Marie Rafalovich, a Jewish couple from the port city of Odessa in southern Ukraine, um, left their home for Paris. The reason for the departure of their home was, according to Patrick Maum, pressure from Tsarist officialdom to abandon their Jewish faith. Joining the Rafalovich family on the departure from Odessa was their four-year-old daughter, Sophie, and her older brother, Ernest. Later in Paris, another son will be born to Herman and Marie, Andre. Herman Rafalovich was a successful banker, and his wife, Marie, would become respected salon hostess in the French capital. In the 1880s, Marie Rafalovich and her daughter, Sophie, became interested in Irish politics. This is during the era of the land war and the imprisonment of Irish nationalist figures for their participation in land agitation. Marie began a correspondence with a prisoner in Galway jail and soon her daughter, Sophie, uh, pictured here in her youth on the left, also began participating in the correspondence with this prisoner, William O'Brien. In her unpublished memoir, Sophie wrote that she loved William, quote, before I even saw him for the sake of Ireland. She called him the Little Eagle and included with one of her letters an eagle's feather that she had picked up at a zoo in Germany. She also included a poem by Robert Browning and another by her brother Andre. William and Sophie finally met in Paris in June 1889 and soon were engaged, with Sophie converting to Catholicism before their marriage. And her brother Andre would later follow a similar path in conversion to Catholicism. And that takes us on a small tributary of this history that will soon bring us back to the main flow of our story. Sophie's brother Andre, again pictured here in his youth, was in these years uh, coming to terms with his own homosexuality. Many, many of Andre's poems had queer themes and he wrote an early scientific study of homosexuality, which argued for its acceptance by society at large and in particular for his adopted church, the Roman Catholic Church. He moved to London where he became part of the gay subculture of the late 19th century, which included Oscar Wilde and the poet John Gray, who would later become Andre's life partner. Andre set up a salon in London and modeled this on the salon his mother had hosted in Paris. In their married life, Sophie and William O'Brien would visit Andre's 
salon in London. And it's interesting um, to me that Sophie writes in her memoirs about the various Irish nationalist figures she would meet at Andre's gatherings in London. For example, Justin McCarthy, a leading figure in the Irish Parliamentary Party. Sophie's wedding in 1890 um, marked in the celebratory cover of the uh, journal United Ireland was, uh, in Patrick Mann's words, the last gathering of the Irish party before the Irish parliamentary party split over the personal conduct of Charles Stuart Parnell. Married life for the Rafalovich O'Briens was, according to Sophie's wholly positive memoirs, a kind of bliss. An indicative line appears in one of the concluding chapters of her autobiography, in which she writes of her and William's relationship that they quote, sometimes we used to say ours was an endless honeymoon. And Sophie appears from her writings to have been passionately and deeply devoted to William. And the one unfortunate consequence of this, I guess, is that her memoirs tell us much more about William himself um, than her, uh, her own political career. And that's what I was really trying to to, to get to with her memoir, but unfortunately it's really uh, all about William. So what were the contours of Sophie's contributions to Irish politics that we can trace? Again, Patrick Mom notes that Sophie enabled her husband's political career by funding his political activities and copying his correspondence, given that his handwriting was notoriously illegible. Uh, Sophie uh, inherited the uh, great portion of the family wealth from the uh, Odessan um, banking uh, business. And Sophie was also part of the women's network surrounding the Irish Parliamentary Party's activities. Although she converted to Catholicism, her Jewish background was always important to her, and it also irked some of her husband's more conspiratorial political opponents who leveled anti-Semitic smears against the couple. Her parents, although initially disapproving of her conversion, became deeply fond of their Irish nationalist son-in-law, William. Sophie also took an active part in charity work throughout her Irish career, setting up craft industries in Mayo, assisting in relief work in Connacht during a period of hunger in the region, and eventually adopting Cork as her home. From William's death in 1928 until her own death in 1960, uh, just on the eve of her 100th birthday, she lived out other adventures, including a period in Vichy, France during World War II. Um, but those are stories beyond the scope of tonight's talk. Sophia Rafalovich is interesting in many senses because she was really no radical uh, nor a feminist in any politically defined sense of the term. In fact, she did not believe in women's suffrage uh, and she differed uh, from her husband on this question who did support women's enfranchisement. Her political and religious identities were both conservative uh, and, and, but yet of course her contribution to Irish nationalism, Irish constitutional nationalism was really important and deserves to be remembered. She was, as Ma'am underlines, a woman of genuine intelligence and social concern. She also represents a chapter in Irish Jewish history, one that has many fascinating links to the Irish revolutionary period, both within Ireland and the diaspora. I hope you'll forgive me uh, for retelling a story that I love from a previous Irish Jewish history talk that indicates this. It's the story of how uh, James Connolly, the revered Irish socialist, found from the radical world of East London um, a comrade for Yiddish language translation. In a 1988 article, Manus O'Riordan first presented this interesting tale of how Boris Kahan a Russian Jewish member of the East London Jewish branch of the Social Democratic Federation worked on this election pamphlet for James Connolly. In 1902, Connolly put himself forward as the Irish Socialist Republican candidate for a council election in Woodkey, Dublin. Because the electoral area took in a Dublin area with a large Jewish community, the party contacted Boris Kahan in East London to secure a Yiddish translation of Connolly's election literature. The Cahans had their own Irish familial links, as O'Riordan noted as well. Boris's sister, Zelda, was married to a Kinsale-born trade unionist, William Payton Coates. The major European events of the early 20th century, war, the Irish Revolution, the Russian Revolution, resonated in Eastern European Jewish diaspora in Britain, creating some convergences of Irish and Jewish history. One was a fear recurrent within far-right conservative circles that the Jews and the Irish, these two sets of troublesome strangers, were set to unite into a revolutionary movement. 
Another remarkable example of how these events of war and revolution created pathways in Irish Jewish history, um, this one tied to reality rather than conspiracy, came about because of Ireland's successful resistance of conscription during the First World War. In June 1916, the Foreign Jews Protection Committee against deportation to Russia and compulsion was set up in England to oppose Russian Empire-born Jews in the country being conscripted into the Russian army. Sharman Kaddish, in her research on how British Jews responded to the Russian Revolution, came across the remarkable case of Sam Ellsbury, a Russian-born Jewish man who was a tailor in Leeds and who was arrested during the First World War for evading the draft. Uh, Ellsbury managed to escape his police captors and fled to Ireland, and that's where he purchased an ex-soldier's papers and then assumed that soldier's Irish name, John Dillon. Late in 1917, Kaddish notes, John Dillon, the Irish tailor with a Yorkshire accent, joined the Yiddish-speaking subdivisional branch of the Tailors' Union in Dublin. John Dillon being a profoundly unlikely name for a leader of a Yiddish-speaking union. So our next story is one that I've been working on for um, a while. Uh, and it's a really remarkable one that also um, crosses the Irish Sea and connecting the radical worlds of Dublin and London. And like Sophie Rafalovich's story, it is one of love and Irish politics, but with an added element of danger. And it's a story I first uncovered in an archive in Moscow in 20, 2018. It's a story of a couple, and I don't even have a photo for uh, these two people. They're so obscure. Sidney Arnold and Rose. And their story begins really at a literary gathering in Dublin and ends um, with the couple unwittingly leading a British secret agent towards his untimely death. In December 1916, a gathering of the Dublin Literary Society was held on the subject of Russian literature. A playwright named Rose McKenna spoke on the topic. She informed her audience that never in the history of the world have people taken so much interest as now in the habits and thoughts of other nations. We are present in the Russian period, she noted, when we are interested in everything Russian and especially in Russian literature. After the chair proposed a vote of thanks and suggested that we should all take up the Russian language, a debate followed during which one Mr. Arnold participated. Arnold, the Irish Times noted, was of the opinion that Irish people should try to look a little outwards to the world. And this is the earliest suggestive evidence I can find of a relationship developing between these two people, Sidney Arnold and his future wife, Rose McKenna. Sidney Arnold, who I believe was the Mr. Arnold described here, was born in Latvia in 1885 and came to Ireland sometime in the early 20th century. He can be found in various Irish newspapers of the era translating Russian language literature into English. Rose McKenna was born Rose Kennedy around 1876 and was by the time of this lecture married to her first husband, an older man, an Irish parliamentary party linked publican named James McKenna from Hove. In March 1917, events in the Russian Empire would draw the attention of the Irish radical world and bring Arnold and McKenna closer together as a protest, a protest in Petrograd on International Women's Day marked the opening of the Russian Revolution. In July 1917, Sidney Arnold featured on the pages of the Irish Citizen, a feminist journal edited by Hannah Sheehy Scaffington. In his letter to the citizen, Sidney Arnold described himself as a, quote, Russian citizen, he was acquainted with the tendencies of the Russian idealists and expressed his support for the revolution, claiming that, quote, Russian women an example to the world by initiating a new and ideal life within the realm of the fair sex. Arguing along similar lines in a pamphlet titled A Plea for Social Emancipation and published in the same year, Rose McKenna argued that the one um, straight road to the universal happiness and prosperity of Ireland lay in socialism. And so these slides are a little bit out of order, but I'll just skip to this one. In 1918, Arnold and McKenna worked together on this pamphlet celebrating the Russian Revolution. It was also the year that McKenna's first husband, James McKenna, died. Arnold uh, is listed on this publication, both uh, with his name anglicized and then also in brackets, um, I guess you could say, uh, Russified to Semyon Aronson. In McKenna's contribution, she wrote that Russia, quote, appeals especially to the young men and women of Ireland who are still full of hope 
and faith and who've not yet lived, outlived their ideals. Interestingly, another co contributor to the pamphlet was the aforementioned Selda Kahan Coates, whose brother translated for James Connolly and whose husband was a trade unionist from Kinsale. So if we trace Rose McKenna and Sidney Arnold through these publications until they got married in London in 1920, what we find is a politically radical couple, also very culturally engaged. But we're no closer to uh, understanding what leads that couple from that position to where I found them, which is in a clandest an archive of clandestine revolutionary activists in Moscow. And so the key to, the, to bridging that gap lies um, in the reports of an ill-fated British secret agent known by the code name Agent Number Eight. Agent Number Eight reported to uh, this man, Lieutenant Colonel Ralph Hayward Isham, who is the head of a British intelligence unit called A2, which was tasked specifically um, with, uh, I guess, really looking at um, the British left and its, its various revolutionary links. In June 1919, following a meeting of the Committee of the Rank and File Conference in London, a left wing organization, John C. Burns, a First World War veteran and a secretary of a soldiers and airmen's union, was approached by a woman named Miss Rose, identified by intelligence historian Julian Potowski as Rose McKenna. Rose requested to purchase arms for Irish Republicans from uh, John C. Burns. But unbeknownst to McKenna, Burns was agent number eight, and agent four, this intelligence unit A2, tasked with penetrating the British revolutionary left. According to a report compiled for A2, McKenna asked Burns, whom she believed to be a sincere political comrade, if he would get hold of some ammunition for the Sinn Féin movement. In coming into contact with Burns, McKenna unwittingly ensured that she and, her, and Sidney Arnold would become part of a consequential network of individual contacts that the agent was constructing within Irish Republican circles in London. Through visits to Dublin in late 1919 and early 1920, Burns would make his mark as the agent who confirmed for British intelligence Michael Collins' importance within the IRA command structure. Eventually, his activities cost him his life. In attempting to prove a case of Irish and Soviet collaboration, Burns became closely involved with Arnold and McKenna's world in Dublin and London as they set about attempting to get passports to travel to Russia, an open line of communication with Lenin and the Irish socialist Jim Larkin, then imprisoned in the US. Burns reported to his handlers in Scotland Yard that McKenna and Arnold had set up a clothing business on Dublin South Frederick Street, which they were using as a front for radical activity. Burns also said about connecting with members of Sinn Féin, not only with the view to providing them with arms, but really with the intent of informing British intelligence about their activities. Burns was successful in securing a meeting with Michael Collins. In February 1920, Burns returned to um, Dublin, intent on delving deeper into the Irish radical network he was building. However, already by August 1919, at least, the IRA intelligence network had rumbled Burns' true role and laid a trap for him. 2nd of March 1919, members of Michael Collins' squad escorted Burns to a pathway in Glasnevin and executed him. What do we know of McKenna and Burns' response to the revelation that their comrade was in fact an informant? We don't know, precisely because now nobody was informing on them. In June 1920, the couple married in London, with Rose taking Sydney's name and becoming Rose Arnold. They resurface again in the historical record in the summer of 1921, when they appeared as comrades, Sydney and Rosa Arnold, seconded from the Petrograd Press Department of the Communist International to work in the Press Bureau of the Third Congress of the Communist International. It was this role that generated the Moscow Archive paper trail where I first found the couple. The Arnolds, are an example of how the intimate worlds of Irish radicalism provided opportunities both for clandestinity and transnational romance, giving us these love stories with uh, elements of risk and danger. Sidney Arnold uh, was not the only Latvian in revolutionary Dublin who married an Irish woman. 
Another was Conrad Peterson, who married the Irish feminist Helen Lena Yates in the same summer that Arnold married McKenna. Peterson had come to Ireland in 1906 after participating in the 1905 uh, revolutionary movement in the Russian Empire. Peterson studied at the Royal College of Science in Ireland and received a certificate in engineering, becoming a naturalized citizen in Dublin in 1915. Conrad left Ireland with his wife Helen in 1920 and they settled in Riga, the capital of a newly independent Latvia. Peterson, like Arnold, had welcomed the Russian Revolution and joined the Socialist Party of Ireland, but a set of documents I came across in the Irish National Archives in Dublin reflected on his trajectory afterwards. In 1922, Peterson wrote to the Irish Free State Government to apply for Irish Free State citizenship. Interestingly, because he had been naturalized before independence, he held a British passport and he didn't automatically get an Irish Free State passport. He and Helen wanted to have that opportunity to return to Ireland. And in a letter to a friend in Ireland, he wrote that, quote, Russia is settling very rapidly into the old, bad or good ways. They have admitted the failure of the communist experiment and are going rapidly back to the capitalist regime and creating a new bourgeoisie instead of the old one. Peterson planned to try and capitalize on this change, namely the introduction of the new economic policy in Soviet Russia to try and trade between Latvia and Russia. But if this didn't work out, Peterson hoped to return to Ireland with his wife. He would eventually return, but by a circuitous historical route. Sam McGrath, in an article on Peterson's life, describes his rise first in the Latvian government and then his decision to flee Latvia with his family when the Soviet Union annexed Latvia in 1944 as it repelled the Nazi forces, leaving first for Sweden. Peterson eventually made it to Ireland in 1946, where he became involved in work with Bord Namona, and he died in Kildare in 1981, age 93 would seem that he finally got that Irish passport. But for my final story of this evening's talk, I'm going to wind the clock back once more on Peterson's story and bring us to our conclusion by the history of the business that first led Peterson to come to Dublin. It's easy to understand why Conrad Peterson swapped Riga for Dublin in particular in the early 1900s. He already had a family connection to the city. Around 1876, Frederick Kapp, who I believe is uh, standing on the doorway on the left, a German migrant in Ireland, actually no, sorry, it's Frederick's relative Alfred in this picture. Uh, Frederick Kapp, uh, a German migrant in Ireland, hired a Latvian migrant by the name of Charles Peterson, who I believe is the figure on the right. He hired Charles to work at his pipe making business and tobacconist shop. Once located on O'Connell Street, and this is the Cap and Peterson store on O'Connell Street photographed, um, but actually now uh, known simply as Peterson's of Dublin and found on Nassau Street. Conrad Peterson, who I was just talking about, was Charles Peterson's nephew. Here's what Peterson's uh, looks like today. Uh, you may um, recognize this when you're just at the top of Grafton Street. You look to the left and you see this tobacconist and pipe shop. So last week, while I was sitting uh, in uh, COVID-induced isolation, I decided I would do some research around the world of Cap and Peters and this Dublin migrant business to see what uh, info I could find. I had already had different hints from other sources that it was home to migrants sympathetic to Irish nationalism. But when I looked into the Bureau of Military History witness statements, I found a story regarding a worker at the Cap and Peters and store that read like something out of a thriller. <laughs> Indeed, this memory belonged to someone who would one day be a detective writer. I decided to add this story to the talk as a kind of a last minute edition. Um, it's something I'm still researching around to really flesh it out. But I find this story really suggestive of the kinds of solidarities and alternate histories that I've sought to present in this talk. So let's set the scene. Uh, it's sometime around 1921. The War of Independence is raging throughout Ireland. And Robert Brennan uh, pictured here a Wexford-born Republican tasked by Eamon de Valera with leading the Irish Republican movement's foreign relations, finds himself outside the home of his comrade, Erskine Childers. It was 15 minutes to go before the 10 p.m. military-enforced curfew came into effect in Dublin. Brennan needed to be inside. He was far from where he needed to be, 
and he needed to play side out until the curfew lifted. A frightened maid answered the door of the children's home. Children's house had recently been raided, and the family were anxious that Brennan head to an alternative location. Brennan got onto his cycle, onto his bicycle, travelled to another contact in Rathgar, someone then working for the British Civil Service with Irish national sympathies. I'm very terribly sorry, this man said, but you know, I must think of my job. Brennan was once more turned away. Brennan took his bike out onto the roadway. It was now three minutes until curfew. The curfew would strike any minute and I would be almost certain to run into a patrol, Brennan remembered, thinking as he stood with his bike on the corner of the street. The city around was dead and then he heard the rat mines chimes announce the hour. Suddenly then from Ratgar Road came the sound of a young man and a woman running and murmuring in terror that they were about to be caught. Blaze of headlights crested over the road alongside the sound of a motor. Recalling the moment, Brennan noted that for the first time I remembered I had papers on me which could get me hanged, which I could not destroy. Acting fast, Brennan ducked into the front lawn of a house and lay down behind a hedge with his bike lying flat. Halt there, halt, Brennan heard as British soldiers dismounted the vehicle and questioned the young man and woman that had ran by Brennan only minutes before. Suddenly, Brennan had a moment of inspiration. He remembered that some months before, he had been at a party at a flat belonging to Fred and Desiree Cogley. Cogley's place in Dublin was a cosmopolitan haunt. Fred had married his uh, French wife, Desiree Toto Bernard in Chile in 1909. Desiree was another migrant with Irish Republic convictions and later the impresario of a popular Dublin cabaret and a leading figure in the founding of the Gay Theatre. At the Cogley's flat, Brennan had met a Russian man named Martinsons, a worker in Captain Peterson's pipe factory who lived above a butcher shop in Ratgar. The Russian party attendee made Brennan promise that if he was ever stuck, he should come to the Ratgar flat. Remembering this offer months later, while lying prone in a Rathgar garden, Brennan got to his feet and freewheeled his bike down the footpath, making for the butchers in the corner, where a light illuminated the rooms overhead, showing someone was at home. Finding a doorway, Brennan pressed the bell and pressed himself to the door as a military lorry rumbled down the road outside. His bearded Russian friend from the party a few months ago came to the door and recognised Brennan instantly. He grabbed him by the shoulder and pulled him in while simultaneously shoving the bike to one side. As Brennan recalled, this done, he appeared to think that all need for caution was at an end, for he began to yell in a voice which appeared to wait the neighbourhood. Maria, Maria, Johan, Johan, look, come see who we have here. Martinson introduced Brennan to his flatmates, mainly Johan Clamanus, a Latvian fish and chip shop owner, and his wife Maria, a temporary woman whom Johan had first met a weekend motorcycle trip. Erroneously, but flatteringly, the Russian claimed their surprise guest was none other than the vice president of the Irish Republic. Over dinner, Martinson proclaimed to Brennan, you will beat the English because your drinks are better, producing a bottle of whiskey with what Brennan described with the air of a conjurer pulling a rabbit out of a hat. Johan and Martinson went on to tell Brennan of their own role in fighting Tsarism in the Russian Empire in the scenes of violence they had witnessed. <clears throat> in the morning, they fed Brennan once more and implored him to return. <clears throat> but he never did see them again. Brennan later heard later that Martinson went back to Russia but knew nothing of the destiny of Mr. Clamanus. Suggestively in the 1911 census, I was able to find a uh, Volodymyr Martinson a wood trainer from Russia living in Ranala, and he listed his religion in the census as free thinker. I've delved more into the story since finding it and found many intriguing details, some of which suggest that Brennan had misremembered details of the story. <clears throat> from details in a Russian language article on the little known migrant history of Mount Jerome Cemetery by Anna Baikova, I learned that Martinson, it seems, <clears throat> was actually the name of the Latvian fish and ship shop owner married to an Irish woman, not the Russian pipe maker. <clears throat> I look forward to delving more into this um, tale, which is new to me and seeing what I can uncover. But 
in many ways, it just kind of goes to show that part of uncovering these histories is just firstly about imagining that they're possible. And um, really, when I just made that, that switch of looking at Irish diaspora involvement of politics, and instead focusing on the involvement of diasporas within Ireland and Irish politics, you begin to find so many of, of, these, of these stories. So I guess then to conclude, I just want to say really that, that each one of the people about whom we've been speaking in this talk point us to the value that Ireland has gained throughout its history by welcoming migrants of all kinds. It's of course too early to write the history of how the Ukrainian refugees that are coming to Ireland will influence and shape this country, uh, but I'm sure that the contribution will be a positive one. The history also should remind us that building a nation is a, is a collective effort, one that always benefits from greater and greater inclusivity. And in truth, we as a nation have often, um, in fact, mostly proved a cold house for refugees. And the ongoing stain that is direct provision is emblematic of that fact. If these stories that interest me point us towards how things can be different uh, when we choose solidarity over division. What's interesting about all these people as well as um, <clears throat> all these migrant case studies is that what they found in Ireland was not merely a place of sanctuary, but also a kind of an idea of shared humanity. And what attracted people from a village or a city in Eastern Europe to something as seemingly distant from their concerns as Irish nationalism was a common desire to live self-determined and fulfilling lives free from hunger and oppression. And it was the compulsion of an internationalist consciousness the idea that all of our struggles are interlinked and any stand against tyranny in one corner of the world is merely one front line in a global struggle to create the world anew. This was the case when Sofia Rafalovich began the correspondence with a Galway prisoner in the 1880s. It was the case when Sidney Arnold fell in love with an Irish playwright in the meeting halls of revolutionary Dublin. And it is the case today as bombs fall on Ukrainian cities. I'm a historian. I'm not a political analyst, so it's not my area to make prognoses about contemporary society. However, I did want to end the talk, given that it is a fundraiser, with some concrete ideas about how um, we can all help that have been proposed from, by people whose expertise and ethics I really respect. Firstly and clearly, uh, donate humanitarian relief for Ukraine, listen to the voices and suggestions of Ukrainians themselves, and as Katrina Kelly has noted, recognize the efforts at great personal cost of the Russians who opposed the war. Now drawing on what we might learn from this history, I've outlined here some further tentative suggestions relevant particularly to Ireland and um, forgive this editorializing. I ask that you remember the words of Irish literature's most famous character of Eastern European descent, Leopold Bloom, who states in Joyce's Ulysses that a nation is the same people living in the same place. Our society can be enriched by an inclusive definition of Irishness, one that includes those born on the island and those who have come here to help build this country. Ensure in whatever ways you can that refugees feel both welcome and valued. Use the moral need to support refugees as a basis from which we fight for better social amenities across Ireland, housing, health, education and more, because this is a win-win situation. Make the case for practical steps like easing the path to citizenship or expanding voting rights to non-citizen permanent residents, including both those from EU member states and elsewhere, so that everyone can feel invested and empowered in shaping the present and future of Irish society. Celebrate and defend Ireland's welcoming approach to the Ukrainian refugees so we can make it the approach to all seeking sanctuary on this island. And before moving to questions, if you have any, I want to finish by reminding you of that moment that symbolizes for me the spirit of this history. That night in the midst of Ireland's war of independence, above a butcher's shop in Rathgar, when an Irish revolutionary sought shelter with friends from Eastern Europe, sharing dinner, drinks, and memories of the fight against oppression. And may our shared history feature many more such moments of intimate solidarity. Thank you, Jakuyu. Great. Uh, so, Apologies again, everyone, for the um, tech hiccups at the beginning. Uh, apologies for having to witness a few minutes of myself and James uh, floundering on the live stream to figure out how to sort it out. But I hope you all found your ways to a, uh, to a correct stream in the end. If you have questions, 
please drop them in the comments box and uh, James can feed them back to me. James, you can just type them into a message in the Zoom chat. And if there's no questions, then we can drop, then we can um, wrap up. Uh, but again, uh, while I'm waiting to see if there's questions, I'll just once more thank everyone for donating. I think that uh, the amount that uh, we raised together, 650 euro, just phenomenal. Um, really, really happy about that. I really appreciate everyone giving so generously. Um, and, and I think it's, it's, I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a really uh, vital cause to uh, support the humanitarian uh, relief efforts in Ukraine. So James, do we have any um, questions? Nothing yet. Well, that's grand. I'd say I'll just give it um, another minute or so, and then we'll wrap up, and uh, everyone can go enjoy their Thursday evening. Uh, a question here asking if there are any books published on the subject or any recommendations. Well, um, there is no, there is no uh, singular study of migrant contributions to Irish politics. There are broad histories of migration in Ireland, um, such as uh, Migration and the Making of uh, Modern Ireland by Brian Fanning. And there's also a lot of this history in uh, the very vibrant field of Irish Jewish history. So um, if you're interested in, in the broader field, I'd certainly uh, look into both that, that broad study and then um, Irish Jewish history as well. But really what interests me is how little there is, how little work has been done um, uh, really on looking at revolutionary politics and migrant contributions to revolutionary politics, because as someone who's been looking at the primary sources of revolutionary politics in 19th and early 20th century Ireland, it's really remarkable how often you see migrants show up at meetings. And it's natural um, that, I guess, that um, causes the cross borders and embrace border crosses. So yeah, so uh, hopefully I um, will publish something on this soon, I have an article, hopefully, uh, that will come out uh, towards the end of the year that goes in detail on the relationship between Sidney Arnold and Rose McKenna. And I also talk broadly about um, migrant contributions to politics as well within that, that field too. So thanks for that question. Um, if there's no more, then I guess we will close up. Great, thanks, James. Okay, everyone, so that just uh, leaves me to, to say, um, have a good evening, dobry vecher, I um, hope to see you all at another event, hopefully in person. Thanks, everyone. Bye.